Hi, welcome back to the second half of this first session of History of World Revolutions. In the first half, we were quickly going through a number of different interpretations of revolution, theories that are used to try to explain revolutions. Uh, we talked about Marx, for example, and his idea that it's really the question of modes of production, of how people interact uh, to create their society and the question of technology and the changes in technology that are in conflict with those modes of production that lead to revolution, what is really in the end a class theory of revolution. We also looked at political theory, looked at Tocqueville, the idea of the centralizing state, and we examined uh, theories that had to do with social equilibrium, Chalmers Johnson, theories that had to do with the sort of natural history viewpoint, of Crane Brinton, and we looked at a variety of theories, from you know, Trotsky to Scotchpole, that deal with the international side. So we have a wide array of interpretations to try to help us explain why revolutions occur. And what you need to draw from that is not so much uh, an intense knowledge of all of these theories, but just a basic outline of how have different people tried to explain revolutions using social theory and you know, the idea of class conflict, social equilibrium, uh, the international factor, what are the different interpretations that have been developed up to now, and as we go through the course, uh, how well can you apply those in specific instances? What makes sense to you as we talk about the events of revolution? Because much of the rest of the course, most of it, uh, is focused on specific revolutions, particularly the early modern revolutions here at the beginning, the English Civil War, French Revolution, the American Revolution, and then what I call the modern revolutions. And we'll have a separate lecture helping separate those two out. But as we go through the series of revolutions, looking at the history of these countries, looking at the actual events of revolution, it's important for you to go back and look at the theories to ask yourself, well, which interpretations really make sense to me? Uh, how important was the international factor in, let us say, the English Civil War, the French Revolution, as opposed to class conflict? Was there class conflict? Or was there something else that we haven't even touched on here that was important? One thing about these theories, even as you use them to try to understand what revolutions are about, what causes revolutions, is to understand that in some ways, as useful as the theories are, they're also terribly abstract. When they talk about what causes revolution, they could be talking about a revolution like the English Civil War back in the 17th century, or they could be talking about the Chinese Revolution in the middle of the 20th century. It really doesn't seem to matter. Uh, history is not at the core of most of these interpretations. Uh, they are highly abstract. They're mostly focused on theories of so, you know, sociological theories, theories of uh, international relations, etc. Uh, but there's not a lot to give you a sense of any uniqueness uh, of different revolutions or how indeed revolutions in the 17th century might be any different from revolutions in the middle of the 20th century. That's why we need history. One of the reasons you need history, not just theory. That's why this first lecture is about not just theories of revolution that we laid out earlier, but what about history? What is the role of history in all of this? Because it's unquestionable that each of these countries that we're going to talk about, each of these societies, has its own unique history. We're going to see, for example, in the English Civil War, that the question of the Protestant Reformation is incredibly important. You know, the fact that much of the population uh, is, are members of Protestant sects of various kinds, whether it's the Anglican Church or whether they call themselves Puritans, a very important distinction, or whether they're Catholics, it's extremely important. It's entirely irrelevant in many of the other revolutions. Most of the other revolutions, religion per se, is really not a key question. But it is in 17th century England. And we need to know what is the significance of that question, why are people concerned with it, to understand the English Civil War. So one of the reasons we need to look at historical backgrounds in each case is to understand the distinctive characteristics of each revolution. It's not that that first half of the lecture that I gave you earlier about theories isn't important. It's vitally important. It helps you organize and figure out, okay, 
if I have different causes, how do I see them and how do they, how do these theories help me uh, take this information that I have and make sense out of it as to causation? That's fine. But at the same time, you mustn't lose sight of the distinctiveness of these different revolutions. That as much as they have broad impact, not only within their own societies, but internationally in many cases. Nevertheless, it is also true that while we can talk about general causation, we also need to know some of the specifics of historical events in each society in order to understand that particular revolution. For example, with the Russian Revolution, we want to take theories about the state, the centralizing state. There's no case that that's more important. In fact, it's far more important in a case like Russia than it is in many of the other cases. Why? Because the Russian state was built on the idea of centralization. The whole idea was that the state was all powerful, that the state played the central role in defending people from nomadic groups, defended it from other foreign external threats, and provided stability in what had been traditionally a highly unstable region. In Russia, that's an extremely important interpretation. But in other cases, the centralizing role of the state, while it might be significant, isn't nearly important, as important. That's a case where de Tocqueville has a lot of significance. And somebody like Scotchpole talks about political questions, has a lot of significance. In other revolutions, not nearly as important. We don't know that unless we know the specific history of the individual country. History also helps to bring out another important factor that often gets lost with theory. And that's the question of human agency. History is really the story of human beings making their own history, shaping the world around them, shaping their societies. If we spent this course talking about social forces, economic forces, structural issues, we'd certainly grasp some of the reality of revolution. But one, it would be incredibly boring. And two, it really wouldn't be a course about history. Because if we're not talking about people, we're not really talking about history. And if you're not talking about people, you have a very hard time understanding how the world has come to the point at which it is today. You really have to look at human agency. How do human beings act? And this is not to argue some you know, great man or great woman theory of history that we have to look at, you know, the great leaders like you know, Robespierre or Lenin. Sure, they're important. What I'm talking about is that people are making decisions as individuals, as groups. They are not just classes of people. They are not just social forces or political forces. They are human, brain, human beings. They have aspirations. They have hopes for what they are going to accomplish with this revolution. They have fears. And they don't know the future. One of the key things that needs to be considered as we look at each of these revolutions is that no one laid out a blueprint at the beginning of one of these revolutions and said, well, this is where we're going, and that's where we went. Revolutions are not buildings that have architectural designs that allow people to put them together. When people set out on a course of revolution, they have some ideas about the fact that they want to bring down the old order and they want to change the world and make it a b better place. But exactly where they're going and how that's going to be accomplished is never very clear, any more than it's clear to anyone sitting here or watching this program as to, well, where am I going to be in 20 years? Well, if you're old enough, you could probably say dead. But other than that, for most of us, you know, life is uncertain. You know, we have plans. We know where we want to go, but we can't be sure that that's where we're going to wind up. And it's very important to keep that in mind as we go through this course that the people you're going to be looking at, you know, whether it's you know, people storming the Bastille in Paris, you know, helping to you know, enter a new stage of the revolution, or the Bolsheviks storming the Winter Palace in Petrograd. The fact is, even these people had really not a very clear idea. They couldn't possibly know what was going to come next. They had hopes. They had plans. But they couldn't be certain. And history brings out that sense of human agency. It also has to do with the question of ideology. When we look at history, more so than any of these abstract theories that I gave you in the first half, we begin to see hopes crystallized in the form of ideologies. 
Now, ideologies usually make people yawn because, oh, you know, somebody, you know, communist ideology, uh, socialist, or whatever, fascist ideologies. You know, you have this long list of things that these are our major precepts and our, you know, the program, the platform of the Communist Party, uh, and some of the stuff that the, you know, French revolutionaries did, you know, in creating pageants and all this stuff was quite ridiculous, uh, absurd by our perspective today when they thought they were creating this new world. Uh, some of the stuff that they did in terms of trying to rename all the months of the year and so what seems kind of odd. But ideology is more than just trappings. It's more than just, you know, dull treatises on politics. Ideology expresses the hopes that people have about revolutions and why they undertake revolutions. It's not just because you have social conflict. It's not just because there are international pressures. It's that people really have incredible hopes of, that they can change their world and make it better. When we look at the Declaration of the Rights of Man, for example, from the French Revolution, it's an extraordinary document about the hopes of what society could be. If you look at the American Declaration of Independence, same kind of thing. If you look at the writings of Che Guevara, the Cuban revolutionary, about creating an equitable society, these are documents that are imbued with an incredible optimism about human beings and what they are capable of. And again, it's really in history that this comes out. You know, when you start dealing with this uh, you know, as political science, you know, as a study of politics, then it becomes, well, this ideology, that ideology, differences, conflicts. But really, what we're talking about here in terms of ideology are what are the dreams that these people have? What is the better world that they hope to create? Now, along the way, a lot of it's going to go terribly wrong. Uh, but along the way, many of the aspects of these revolutions will become central parts of human belief systems and even human reality. The idea that people are created equal, not necessarily equal in talent, but equal in opportunity, that they will all have equal opportunity, uh, is a basic tenet of most human societies today, the overwhelming majority of human beings. And no, that doesn't necessarily take a democratic government uh, to have that kind of ideal, but it has become a pervasive human ideal. The idea that the state has a basic responsibility to its own citizens, not just in terms of saving them from famine uh, and catastrophic disease, uh, but to see to their welfare to, that they have uh, what we would conceive as, as a reasonable standard of living. Uh, that's a product of revolutionary ideologies uh, that has become, again, pervasive in the world. So history helps bring out the hopes that people have, the dreams that they have. Why do they undertake these revolutions? Some of it is from desperation, that's true, that the old system is just so bad and has imposed so much on them that they can't stand it anymore. But much of it is very positive. It's that they believe that they can make a better world. And it's really in studying the historical record that we see these people and can actually understand what their dreams were and what they hoped to accomplish. Now, something else that's important about history is it will help us break out these revolutions and deal with the issue that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. And that is, how do we distinguish between these revolutions? Not one by one, but at least if we're going to be talking about revolutions that span from the 1600s to the 1900s, is there some distinction here? And we're going to make a distinction that historians have made in general about the evolution of uh, human societies over the past four or five hundred years. And that is the distinction between what we call early modern society and modern society. And for our purposes, and I'll get into the detail of this in a couple of minutes, for our purposes it really means that early modern refers to three revolutions. The first three we're going to talk about. The English Civil War, the American Revolutions, we're going to talk about two of them actually. The first one falls clearly into early modern. And then the French Revolution. So the first three revolutions, the ones that occur in the 17th and 18th centuries, we're going to see our early modern revolutions. And then the rest of them, the ones that stretch really through the 20th century, because um, all of them break out really from the beginning of the 20th century on, that these modern revolutions, while there is overlap 
in terms of some of the factors influencing both early modern and modern revolutions, there are also some important distinctions. And we're going to start today understanding some of those distinctions because we're going to focus for the rest of today, the second half of this first session, on early modern revolutions and looking in terms of historical background at the world in this early modern period. Okay? So that's really what we're going to try to accomplish through much of the rest of today before we summarize, and that is what was the world like in the early modern period? What was about to change in the early modern world? And how is this re relevant to these first three revolutions? We'll briefly talk about you know, the modern era, but that I'm going to save for another lecture. After we finish looking at these three revolutions, when we finish the French Revolution, I'm going to do a lecture just on what we'll call the modern world. But today, what we're going to do is look at the historical background of the early modern world. What was it like? What things were changing? You know? What ideas were changing? What institutions were changing? In general, how did these changes contribute to these revolutions? Because we're going to see here a set of factors that clearly feed into these three revolutions. As distinct as they may be, and we're going to look at the individual histories of each of these countries before we look at their specific revolutions, there are some general patterns in terms of what's changing in the world. And it's possible to say this because this is a narrow scope that we have in the first part of the course, because all three of these revolutions are revolutions that occur in the Western world. Okay? in Europe and North America. So we can make these generalizations with a fair degree of comfort because we're just dealing with the Western world at this stage. When we get to the modern revolutions, it's a different story because, of course, we're going to be looking at China, Vietnam, Iran, Russia, which people variously put in, you know, describe as Central Asian, you know, Western European, Eastern European. It has a lot of different definitions. We're going to look clearly at some very distinct uh, cultural and historical experiences when we get to the 20th century. But for now, there are some generalizations we can make about the Western world, at least, that are relevant because all three revolutions that we look at at the beginning of the course are all revolutions that occur in the Western world. In looking at the early modern period, we want to look first at what I call the world that was. What was the world like before these revolutions took place? Okay. Two important characteristics of European societies at the beginning of the early modern age. One was divine right monarchy. What does that mean? What that means is that monarchs, rulers in Europe, claimed the right to rule on the grounds that they were divinely ordained to rule their subjects. In other words, why can Louis XIV be proclaimed King of France? Because God has ordained his family to be the rulers of France. So this is very different from our idea in the 20th century of popular sovereignty. Why does the president get to be the president? Because we elect him. Or even why do revolutionary leaders get to be the leaders? Because there's been a mass movement that's put them in power. That power has flowed from the bottom up to install these people in power. But this interpretation, divine right monarchy, says that no, not really. It's because God has ordained this individual, this family, this dynasty, to rule over you. Now, of course, this does not mean that you can rule arbitrarily. It's assumed that God has chosen someone who will rule with con concern and care for the people put in his or her charge. But nevertheless, the idea that you would question the right of this dynasty or this individual to rule was absurd because, of course, it had the imprimatur of the divine. Another commonality besides this type of political institution was Christendom. That as of the early 1500s, let's take the year 1500 to be safe, Europe consisted of a series of societies that shared a common religion, Christianity, with a single church in essence, a single sect if you will, the Catholic Church, uh, 
was really the only expression, uh, the institutional expression of that religion. There were no serious competitors uh, towards the Catholic Church uh, with its center in Rome. So we have a uniformity, at least institutionally, in terms of religion uh, that is up until 1500 largely unquestioned. So we have divine right monarchy and we have throughout Europe uh, a shared, at least Western Europe, a shared religious, not only set of religious beliefs, but religious institution in the Catholic Church. In addition to the state and we can call cultural beliefs, namely religious beliefs in this instance, in Christianity, we also have a fairly common mode of production, which is feudalism. And again, feudalism is essentially a tribute system, meaning this, that most of Western Europe's population are peasants who live on land that is controlled by large landowners. They pay tribute to that landowner in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, uh, a certain portion of their crops may go to the landlord. They may be required to work on the landlord's land several days a week. In other words, they have a plot of land that they work, but they also have a piece of land that belongs to the landlord that they have to go work on every day, or let's say one day a week. So you spend most of your time working in your own plot of land, but then you have to give a percentage of that to the landlord. Then you go work on his land, and that's another form of feudal dues or feudal tribute. You may have to go work in his manor house, you know, spending your daughter or your wife, whomever, has to go and work as a house servant a certain number of days a week as well. These are obligations that you have. Now, there is assumed a mutual obligation here, and that is that, well, the landlord collects tribute. He allegedly provides you with protection. Uh, these arrangements had evolved after the fall of the Roman Empire when there had been political decentralization and even disintegration, when there was a high degree of lawlessness, and people were looking for protection. They wanted stability, and landlords could provide that. Uh, the peasant, on the one hand, may be protected. At the same time, he may also may serve in the army uh, all of the landlord uh, to help exercise that protection. But there is a mutual relationship here, a mutual obligation, tribute in return for protection. That's basically what feudalism is about. And of course, cutting in on all of this is the monarchy itself. The monarch is essentially the greatest of all the feudal lords. He's the one that rules over all the other lords. Uh, so ultimately, this divine right monarch is really the top guy in a pyramid consisting of these landlords who in turn are drawing tribute from all the peasants below. And most people in this society are peasants. As far as social organization of peasants, it largely focuses on the village. In most European societies, this is the central institution other than the church, and even the church is found in the village, uh, for peasants. Uh, this is where you organize your activities. You know. How are we to get a road built? Uh, well, we'll work together in the village council. There is also, at the heart of the village, what is called common land. In other words, a piece of land set aside for everyone's use. Well, what would be the purpose of that? Well, you're a peasant, you have a few acres of land that you work, but you don't have any place for pasturage. You know, you've got a couple of cows, maybe a pig, something. Where are they going to go eat? You don't want them eating out in the field, and you don't want to set the, any part of the field aside for the animals to eat because you want to eat that stuff. You have to have some place to put them for pasture. The common lands serve that purpose. So you set the animals out on that common land, and everyone gets to do that. They get to share in that common interest. So this is something that ties peasants together. And often family relationships and long history tie them to the village as well. So there's a certain commonality, communal aspect to the villages and the fact that these villages usually, most of them have a long history. People are tied to these villages. This is where the, the church is, the priest is. There are a variety of factors that tie them there and to the landlord as well. So it is a fairly stable set of relationships that exist around 1500. Now in urban areas, urban areas are not very large. 
I mean, a huge city would be, if a city has 200,000 people in it, that would be enormous. Right? London, for example, would be considered an enormous city. But to the extent that there are towns and cities, uh, the urban population uh, consists of merchants and artisans. And both of these groups, merchants as well as artisans, are usually organized into what they call guilds. What a guild is is a professional association. And with the artisans, its purpose is most clearly seen, although it serves a similar purpose with merchants. The guild helps set work standards and production standards, standards of quality and price, meaning how long did someone work in the shop? You, know, you had master craftsmen, and they had people working below them. What's the typical length of the day for work? The guild would have some say in that. More importantly, the guild oversaw quality of product. You, know, you have to produce up to a certain standard of quality to be a member of the guild. And even more importantly, the guild helped set prices, largely through production control. How much? Let's say you're a candlestick maker. How many candlesticks are you going to make this year? What quality are there? And therefore, what price uh, can we set on them? This is all controlled to one degree or another by the guild system. This is not a free market system. You don't just go out and produce as much as you can. You don't need to because if the guild can keep prices up at a reasonable level, then you can get what is, comes to be called a just price for your goods. You can earn a living wage. And this is the system that exists in the urban areas. Merchants do much the same thing, trying to control the price of goods to maintain stability. The idea is not grow as fast as you can, produce as cheaply as you can, and make a bigger profit. It's there's a certain just price for goods. If we all agree that we're going to produce a certain number of goods at a certain quality and a certain price, we can all do reasonably well. And within the artisan shop, there's a certain sense of a family existing, although the relationships may not be strictly family relationships. Uh, people who are apprentices being brought up you know, and trained as master craftsmen eventually. Uh, oftentimes the apprentices lived with the master craftsmen. So it's, a, again, a relatively stable system. To say it's an ideal system, no. Is it always a just system? No. Uh, but it is a system with considerable stability and in which if you're in the system, your interests are reasonably protected. As far as the elites in society, the landlords in particular, clergymen are also in this category of elites, they are organized in most of these societies into what the French call estates. We in the 20th century might be tempted to call this, these estates uh, a legislature but they're not. In France, okay, there are three estates. There's the nobility, the clergy, and the commoners. When the French king needs money, and he usually needs money, he calls what is known as the estates general to a meeting. The estates general consists of representatives from each of the three estates. And usually the reason it would be called is to say, look, I need some money. Let's cut a deal here. You know, I'll give you something. You'll give me some money. You know, you'll let me raise taxes or you know, provide a loan to me, and I'll do something nice for you, whatever that may be. These organizations are not legislatures in part because they're highly unrepresentative, meaning, for example, with the states general, there are really only three votes. There may be 300, 600, 900 people in the Estates General, but there's only three votes in the end. One by the nobility, one by the clergy, and one by the commoners. And inevitably, the nobility and the clergy always vote together, so it's two against one. Uh, so these are not representative bodies, in, well, they're not legislative bodies, and they're certainly not the kind of democratic or republican institution that we're familiar with. They do provide an expression of interest, a representation of interests of the various groups in society. But it remains hierarchical. It's clear that to the extent there is power in the estates, it's the power of the nobility and the clergy, not the power of the commoners that's significant. So to the extent that there are political institutions other than the monarchy, they reflect this idea and this reality of a hierarchy, you know, top to bottom. One other 
reality of this time, uh, besides the idea of Christendom as a religious institution, is religious perspective. Now, people by this time really didn't expect you know, the second coming of Christ to occur anytime soon. Uh, at the beginning of the Christian era, many Christians thought that's what was going to happen, that the second coming was just a few years away. By the 1500s, they're pretty well over that idea. But at the same time, there is still a strong belief in the immediacy of the divine, that daily events, particularly among most people in society, peasants, etc., artisans, uh, that if something happens in the world, if there is a natural occurrence, got to say a plague, uh, let's say catastrophic storms or an earthquake, believe that this is direct divine intervention in the world around you. Not that it's some kind of natural phenomenon. This isn't saying, well, look, God created the earth and then all these other things happen, you know, based on what he started. Uh, this is a belief that those actions are direct interventions by the divine in the world around you. That sense of immediacy. I mention this and these other factors because many of these are going to be challenged, many of them are going to be changed, and they are changing even as we enter the 1500s. And they are going to have an impact, a role, in what happens in terms of revolution. Indeed, in the time that we're talking about through these first three revolutions, we can really talk about it as an age of revolutions, not just because of those three upheavals, the English Civil War, the American Revolution, and the French Revolution, but because there was such upheaval in so many areas, in the scientific world, in political thought, in religious thought, that this has been called the age of revolutions. Not simply because of these three revolutions, but because of these other radical changes that are going on. One of those is the scientific revolution. And here I give you a few examples of people that personify the scientific revolution. Copernicus, Galileo, and Robert Harvey. Copernicus is the Polish monk, scientist, uh, who first postulated the idea that rather than the sun revolving around the earth, it is in fact the earth that revolves around the sun. Now, his conclusion was based upon scientific observation. His observation of the movement of heavenly bodies led him to this conclusion. This was a conclusion that was highly upsetting to the Catholic Church. Why? Because the general understanding at the time, the ruling orthodoxy, was that the earth was at the center of the universe. And the logic of that was that God had created human beings and the earth. Therefore, they and their planet took primacy in the universe. And where else would the place of primacy be but at the center of the universe? So this perception isn't based upon scientific observation, which was just coming into existence. It's based upon a deduction from theological presumptions. And what's so upsetting about Copernicus's idea is that it totally contradicts those presumptions. Galileo adds to the problem and gets himself in hot water with the papacy uh, when he essentially confirms uh, Copernicus's theory uh, by using the instrument, the telescope. Finally, Robert Harvey makes another major discovery, and that is about the circulation of the blood through the human anatomy. Up until this time, until Harvey's work, it, people weren't aware of the fact that essentially the blood circulated through the body. And again, he did this through scientific observation by you know, examining human cadavers as well as animal remains, uh, coming to these conclusions. The significance of all of this, whether we're talking about you know, the earth revolving around the sun or the human circulatory system, is the way they came to their conclusions by using what's known as the scientific method. 
that what you do is you create a hypothesis. I believe this is how something works. And then you test that hypothesis through experimentation, through observation. And only when you can repeatedly show that indeed through repeated experiments or observations, the hypothesis is accurate, can you call that a theory or eventually a scientific law. The idea that you will gather evidence, that you will run experiments, that you will use a rational process uh, studying the physical world around you to come to conclusions about how the physical world works is the scientific revolution. And it is a radical departure from the past. Uh, if we go back to the early Greeks, again, that's not how they went about coming to conclusions about the physical world around them. Uh, they deducted from first principles that they developed. You know, I have this principle that says, you know, all life is sacred or something. And from that I deduct certain conclusions about the world around me. Just as Catholic theologians had done in coming to the conclusion about where the center of the universe was. Scientific methodology is a completely different approach, saying I don't start with any first principles. I simply come up with a hypothesis. I observe, say, well, I think this is why, you know, rain falls or something. And now I have to experiment or observe and test that hypothesis. And if it doesn't fit the facts, if the experiments don't prove it to be true, then I have to dismiss that hypothesis and come up with another. A radically different way of viewing the physical world and of trying to determine how it works. Another development, Christian humanism. The idea of going back and looking closely, studying and learning from classical literature and the great classical works of the past, particularly the works of the Greeks and the Romans, the Egyptians and others. Again, this was an idea that knowledge and understanding could come from sources other than religious texts, that we can look to the writings of early philosophers, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and learn from them, even if they're not Christian. In fact, apply their ideas to better understand our own Christian beliefs, as they would say, or the world around us, uh, that we can use these early texts. And even more importantly, in studying those, uh, that we have to be able to distinguish what are accurate translations and transcriptions of these texts. Doesn't seem very important. Seems kind of boring, you know. Well, do we really care, you know, whether you know this version or that version is the entirely accurate one? Well, in fact, a whole group of intellectuals developed called philologists, who were concerned with this idea. And this is important, even though it sounds like saying, well, that's something a librarian should be concerned with. Up until this time, people didn't care whether a particular text was completely accurate, including the Bible. You know, you're reading through it and it's got 10 extra, you know, one Bible has 10 chapters and the next one has 15. Well, where'd the other five come from? It's not that important. Don't worry about it. Much of what had come down, whether it was biblical scripture or the writings of Socrates or what was, you know, the recorded works of Plato, etc., from ancient Greece or within Christian tradition had been corrupted over time. You know, people make copies. They didn't have Xerox machines. They didn't always copy it right. Uh, they often copied it from oral tradition. You, know, you said this to me, you told me this, and I copied it down. It came out a little different uh, than the last time we copied it down. But people were unconcerned with that kind of thing. They didn't think historically. And they didn't think about, well, gee, it's been a thousand years, you know, or 1,500 years in this case, you know, since some of the stuff was first spoken, since some of these ideas were first generated. Maybe they've changed. Maybe they've been reinterpreted, and we're not aware of that. Philologists began to look at this question and discover, indeed, that a lot of stuff had been added to the Bible. There were a lot of important historical documents that were totally inaccurate because people had added things to them and hadn't bothered mentioning that. You know, we get a little touchy about it these days. We say you have to footnote, you know, you know like plagiarism and so on. Um, you know, well, I just added something. You know, I got this from some other guy and I put it in, you know, it was your book, but I added an extra chapter because this guy's chapter was really good. I didn't think yours was that good, so I put it in your book and put your name on it. <laughs> you get sued for that now. But in 
1500 when people were not focused on history and the idea of you know, history making a difference. These were revolutionary ideas that we have to look over time and see that things have changed. People's thought processes have changed. These documents are not accurate. They don't accurately reflect facts. We need a better understanding of the past and how human society has changed. And that indeed society has changed. And we need to know what it was like a thousand years ago versus what it's like today. Again, a revolutionary set of ideas. The whole idea of being concerned with time and with historical change. And with the Renaissance, great artists like Michelangelo and the political theorist, if you want to call him that, Machiavelli. Michelangelo's work and the work of other Renaissance artists, again, focuses attention on human beings and the here and now. I'm not a great connoisseur of art and don't have nearly the appreciation that other people do. But if you show me a piece of work by, by Michelangelo, such as the Pietà, which is the statue representing the dying Christ in the arms of his mother, and show me a piece of medieval art, I can immediately tell you, oh, those are different. Okay? Because medieval art is flat, okay? and it has no proportions to it. You, know, you see a mother with a baby, and the baby's almost as tall as the mother. You know? It's baby Yui. Uh, it, the representation of the human body wasn't that important. You know, to be accurate or not didn't make any difference. When it comes to the Renaissance, you know, Michelangelo was studying human anatomy. When he drew, you know, draws a muscle, you know, paints it on the Sistine Chapel, or when he does it you know, with, you know, with a statue like the Pieta, it looks like a real human muscle. A focus on human beings, that human beings are important, that the here and now is important. Machiavelli is the same way. When he talks about politics, I mean, Machiavelli is the original, you know, you know get them before they get you. You know, he, you know, his advice to princes and kings is, you don't want to leave a wounded enemy around. You know, you either buy him off or you kill him. <laughs> Nothing in between. And this is the kind of pragmatic, here and now, real-world politics that you would imagine goes on and does go on today. But 500 years ago, as different as Michelangelo and Machiavelli may appear, they're both showing an increasing concern, as many people are, with the real world, with the here and now, with trying to understand this world as it is, using scientific principles, using history, using art, political theory, and while well, all of these people would declare themselves to be fervent Christians, the fact is they're starting to separate the here and now from the theological. That if you're talking about the here and now, then we have scientific principles, we have political theory, we have art that focuses on the world that we live in at the present moment. If you want to talk about theological ideas, that's fine, but that's a different world. We're starting to make separations here between these two. Not to saying that religion is extremely important. It's extremely important, but people are beginning to say, but there are two different spheres here of influence. One is a source of or a target of human inquiry, which is the world around us as we see it. Another is a spiritual world where religion prevails. In addition to these intellectual changes, there are also some very real economic changes that are going on. This is a time in these centuries, the early modern period, when wealth is expanding in the Western world, in what are called the ages of commerce. This is the period when Europe reaches out, the Portuguese are exploring the African coast and on to the Middle East and India. Columbus discovers the New World, and we have a rapidly expanding international trade in precious goods, silks and gold and silver, spices. And in the later phases, in the second half of this age of uh, commerce, we have the rise of great plantation systems, the production of goods like sugar, and cotton, on a massive scale, not only in their production, but in their international exchange. 
the pace and size of international commerce is growing rapidly in this period, as is domestic commerce and exchange. Wealth is expanding. Much as we look at the last decade in the world economy and see a similar kind of situation where the amount of goods being produced, the exchange of goods, the speed at which they are exchanged is increasing, this period was equally revolutionary, although far more prolonged. And you know, today we think in 10 years, God, that's a long time. Here, over a century and a half, two centuries, we see a rapid expansion in wealth and generation of wealth, particularly through international commerce, although on the domestic order, it is also increasing. In addition to simply increasing wealth, there is another factor here, and that is inflation. Mr. Greenspan wasn't around to help the Europeans at that time to increase their interest rates and keep inflation down. That was because people hadn't worried about inflation before 1500. Inflation was largely non-existent. The level of economic activity around the globe was so low uh, that prices didn't go up very fast. I mean, you really, the term inflation wouldn't mean anything to somebody in the year 1500. And if you go back through the centuries and see how difficult uh, commercial exchange was, whether it was local, you know, poor roads, lack of uh, vehicles, lack of draft animals, uh, on and on. The obstacles, and of course, sea bearing traffic was even more uh, inhibited. The idea of producing large amounts of goods and moving them great distances and exchanging them uh, just wasn't practical in most cases. That's why, in the early age of commerce, what was being exchanged? Things that had a very high unit value, you know, gold, silver, spices, you know, where you could take a little box of spice and make a fortune out of it because you couldn't afford to ship bulk items. But as we go on in this period, not only are we exchanging these precious goods, but we're also beginning to exchange bulk items in large quantities. Now, we've got inflation. Now, as the pace of economic activity grows, inflation comes with it. And you may say, well, what's the big deal? You know, so inflation. Well, consider this as one factor as we look at some of these revolutions, particularly the French Revolution. Remember those feudal dues that people are collecting, that are the landlords, that are the dominant group in these societies. Most of those are fixed. In other words, if you're not paying me, you know, one twentieth of your crop a year, most of your other dues are coming in the form of a fixed amount. You owe me three ducats a year for something. Over the centuries, more and more of these dues had been translated into a fixed amount of money that was owed. Well, that's fine as long as three ducats is still three ducats. But when three ducats isn't three ducats anymore because of inflation, what are the landlords going to do? Well, they're going to try to do something to the peasants, and it's not going to be pleasant because they have to try to squeeze more money out of them because they're getting killed by inflation. So inflation is important. The growth of wealth is important because it's going to help set off the rise of capitalism and essentially the initiation of the Industrial Revolution. That's a bit beyond the first part of the course, the early modern period. But it is creating a group of capitalists uh, focused on something other than just while producing or exchanging, let's say you're a merchant, exchanging X number of goods each year at a certain price. As wealth increases, the opportunities will arise to say, look, at, if I could exchange twice as many goods, okay, even if the price falls a bit, even if the price falls 10%, if I can trade twice as much of the product at 10% discount, like Mattress Mac, I'll make more money. Lower my price, but increase the quantity, and I make a bigger profit. Artisans, so some of them are going to think about the same thing. If I could produce 20, twice as many candlesticks, even if I had to knock the price down by 20%, I'll still make more money. The beginnings of capitalism beginnings of these ideas about profit and about paying wages to accomplish this goal. So wealth creation and inflation are extremely important because they're eating away at some of the basic standards and realities of the early modern world. Absolute price stability, not going to exist anymore. The idea that landlords can simply collect fixed fees 
for feudal tribute going to be undermined. And many people are going to look at the guild system and say, it's confining, it's inhibiting. We need to go in another direction. All of these things are going to be threatening to certain groups in society. And finally, again, open, you know, in the non-economic sphere. As I said, religion remains important through all of this. But even there, there are corroding influences, not just the fact that people are maybe separating out the physical world from the spiritual world and saying, well, science and history, etc., they all deal with the physical world, religion can deal with the spiritual world. More than that, within the religious world itself, there is a deep schism, a divide, as the Protestant Reformation begins with figures like Luther and Calvin. Now, in a course about revolutions, we're not going to get deeply into the Reformation, other than talk a little bit about it, but not into the, a lot of the theological debates that went on uh, in the Protestant uh, Reformation. It simply isn't necessary for our purposes. But we are going to look at some of the underlying forces that influence the Reformation. Specifically, the Reformation is driven not just by you know, abstract theological disputes that we might not well understand. You know, what is transubstantiation? Can't even pronounce it. There are, however, some very real issues here about how people relate to the divine. Under the Catholic Church, there was a strong emphasis, as there was in society as a whole, as we know, on hierarchy. If you want to be in touch with God, how do you do that? Well, you go to the priest, because the priest is the one who says Mass. The priest is the one who can read the Bible. It's in Latin, and 99% of the people in Europe can't read Latin. Uh, first of all, they can't read, and secondly, for most of them, it's not really their native or regional language. So if you want to be in touch with the divine, you have to rely upon the priest. He is the intermediary. But what if you don't want to do that anymore? What if you feel you want a personal, direct experience, that you want to take your spiritual life into your own hands? This is one of the forces driving the Reformation. Whatever the theological debates are, and again, for most of us, it would be hard to understand them uh, today, but whatever those theological debates are, the fact is that one of the driving forces here is the idea of the individual's right and responsibility in this area, in religion. And as a reflection, its importance is that it's a reflection of a larger concern by people about the idea of what role do they have in their own lives, in the world around them. We see that monarchs claim to divine right, and therefore the right of common people to question their rule, largely excluded. And to the extent that the estates have a representative system, as in France, the estates general, there too it's a hierarchy. The nobility and the clergy really control that. People are beginning to question that and talk about popular sovereignty, about the rights of common people to influence the political system. This debate in the religious sphere is important because people are starting to talk the same way. We don't want this hierarchy. We want to be able to influence, to have control over our religious experiences. And if we're going to have someone who ministers to our needs, a minister, we want the right to select him. We don't want this appointment from the top down. So in religion and in politics, there is this idea that hierarchy is not always the best thing. It has been assumed for centuries, or a lot longer than that, that hierarchy is, you know, that's the way God wanted the world to be. And whether we're talking China or Europe or Asia or the Middle East or Africa, that's generally the assumption that this hierarchy is what is meant to be. And there is this some kind of divine ordination uh, that provides us with rulers. But people are beginning to think at both the political level and the religious level that maybe something else should prevail, that maybe people have a right to influence both the political sphere and the religious sphere. And the Reformation, in some ways, is a reflection of that. One other 
important aspect of the Reformation is what's called the Protestant ethic. Now, this has been over-interpreted to basically say, well, look, at it's the Reformation that leads to capitalism. That's a long stretch. But it is true that just as we've talked about the sort of democratic orientation of the Reformation, of people wanting a say in their religious beliefs, so too uh, Protestantism tended to put responsibility upon the individual, to talk about the individual's responsibility and rights. Specifically, within Protestantism, and it depends upon which sects, Lutheranism did not put as much emphasis on this, but Calvin certainly does. Uh, there is an emphasis on what's called predestination. And basically what predestination says is that, look, God has already chosen the damned and the elect. Okay? If there are 500 of us living in this village, God has already decided how many, 212, let us say, who are saved. Okay? They're the elect. And the rest of them are damned. Okay? And there's just no sense in worrying about it. <laughs> it's already decided. And the logic here is that if God is all-knowing and all-seeing, he already knows what's going to happen. So he knows which people are damned and which ones are you know, saved. Now, you might say, well, gee, that seems to be an encouragement for everybody to go do whatever they please, right? Because if you're already damned or elect, what difference does it make? But the catch is this. We know who the damned versus the elect are by their behavior. So if you don't act properly, we know you must be among the damned. And being among the elect can be determined in part by good behavior, by obeying you know, the Christian commandments, etc. But also, there are signs based on your wealth. Now, this is not an encouragement to ostentatious wealth, but it's clear that if you are successful and are earning considerable amounts of money, uh, that God has looked favorably upon you, you must be one of the saved. So success in business, rather than just being seen as a material accomplishment, I'm making more money than you are, <laughs> is seen in some ways as a positive reinforcement to your spiritual concerns. And people are very definitely and immediately concerned about the end, you know, the end of their lives, about their salvation. And something that can give them comfort is if they are successful in business, there is a sign that they are indeed among the saved. So this shift in religious thinking encourages people in terms of their ideas about their own individual rights and responsibilities and about the idea that accomplishment in the material world may be a sign not definitely, but may well be a sign that you are indeed among the saved. So this is going to have an important impact upon how people conduct themselves, encouraging individualism and also encouraging the idea that material accomplishment is a very positive sign, that it may well be an indication that you are among the saved, among the chosen. Now, another idea, not necessarily tied to the Reformation, but tied to these ideas of individualism and of competitiveness, of the idea of material achievement, is the concept of careers open to talent. Now, in the world as it was, how did the nobility get to be the nobility? Well, at some point, somebody's great-great-great-grandfather or something you know, had a sword and a hoss and managed to whack somebody's head off, uh, and therefore won a land grant from a king somewhere. But for the reality of most of the nobility in Europe in the 1500s, they inherited their wealth. And it was meant to be. I mean, this was the prevailing political, social, economic ideology, that people are born to a certain station in life. It is not that you can never change your station in life. But the greatest likelihood is that you will remain in the station to which you are born. And the belief that you are in fact, just as the king is divinely ordained, you as a member of the nobility have certain distinguishing qualities uh, that make you 
a member of the nobility, make you superior. You are born to be rich, born to be powerful. However, these other ideas that are percolating in society, individualism, the achievement of material wealth, the idea of the growth of wealth and the fact that maybe gills and aren't all they're cracked up to be and there are other ways in which one could pursue economic activity that are more competitive. These ideas that are starting to circulate challenge as well the concept of noble privilege, of the privilege of birth. What people begin to argue, some intellectuals, particularly among enlightenment thinkers, is the idea of careers open to talent, meaning this, that if there are opportunities in the political and the economic world, they should be available to people who are most talented, most able to carry out those obligations. For example, jobs in government, you know, who are the officers of the military, who are the administrators of the royal government. They're members of the nobility. Now, this is not a hard and fast line, as we'll see in France. Others are brought in. But even when commoners are brought in, they're eventually made members of the nobility. The argument here is that that should not be. Members of the nobility are not or should not be given exclusive access to such opportunities. Your opportunity should be limited only by the talents that you have. And this, again, is a very radical idea. You know, this is a hierarchical society. People are pretty much born into the status to which, in which they will die. This has been going on for centuries. Uh, it's largely immobile, not entirely, but largely immobile. And now uh, there are certain thinkers who are challenging that and saying, no, there should be change. And the change should be that if you have the talent, you should be able to take the job. This is r as radical as the idea of communism in the 19th and 20th centuries. That you, know, you aren't just born into a certain status in life and remain there all your life. As I said, many of these ideas were being propounded by Enlightenment thinkers, uh, people in the 18th century in particular, who believed that seeing the changes around them, Christian humanism, the development of philology, uh, the study of classical texts, uh, and even the Reformation itself, uh, in which for example, Luther, Luther's argument is that he was studying the Bible and using reason uh, to come up with his ideas. Well, Enlightenment thinkers have grabbed onto that idea in the 18th century and saying, yeah, that's exactly what we need to do. This is how we are going to change the world. Uh, if you want to look for the intelligentsia, the revolutionary thinkers who inspire the American and French revolutions in particular, these are the people that you look to. These are the people that have radical and revolutionary ideas because they're saying we need to take reason and apply it everywhere. You want to study art, you want to study science, politics, and practical politics, meaning how should our government really be organized? How should society be organized? Should it really be in this form of estates, you know, peasants, you know, and commoners in general, artisans, and then the nobility and the clergy? Or is that a totally ineffective and unacceptable idea? And religion, even uh, in its reformed version in the 18th century after the Reformation uh, is still in the eyes of many Enlightenment thinkers corrupt. And by corrupt they mean filled with superstitions, beliefs that simply aren't logical. Indeed, many of the Enlightenment thinkers are what we call deists. They believe in God, but they don't believe in the personal immediate God uh, that most Christians believe in at this time. Uh, their belief is that yes, there is a God and God created the universe and set it in motion. Uh, but he left it there to function essentially on its own uh, under a set of what we would call natural laws. These are the governing laws of the universe. And the world essentially functions uh, with these principles and laws. And no, God doesn't come down and you know, save this child from, uh, let us say, yellow fever today and cause an earthquake tomorrow. Ultimately, he may be the cause of all this, but this God has essentially left the world functioning with these natural laws, what we might call today in some cases scientific laws. And the Enlightenment thinkers believe that we can use our human reason to discover what those natural laws are. And we will then take those natural laws 
and hold up society and all that it is and match it to those natural laws and discover if indeed our society is the best that it can be or does it fall short? If natural law says that we should have careers open to talent, for example, then why don't we? Then our society is in conflict with natural law. We can use human reason to discover what is the ideal society and then create that ideal society. We can bring human society as it is in compliance with these natural laws. We can change it. Human beings can go and change the world. They can change their societies, change the political system, the economic system, the social system, the religious system. We can do all that. We can make a new world. These thinkers were as revolutionary as Karl Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, Mao Zedong. These were radical, radical ideas for the 18th century. And much of what we will see in the 18th century revolutions is inspired by them. This is the ideology. This is the human optimism that inspires at least these revolutions. The belief that you can remake the world to be a better place human, using human reason. Rousseau is a classic example of that uh, in the political sphere. Rousseau, one of the Enlightenment thinkers, argues for popular sovereignty. His idea of the social contract is that Yes, we have kings. And by the way, Rousseau was not opposed to monarchies. But we have to understand that it is not divine right that allows the king to rule. It is that at some point in time, a social contract was reached, unwritten though it may be. After all, the English have a constitution that's never been written down. But at some point in time, a contract was achieved between the people and the monarchy in which the people granted to the monarchy the right to rule under certain conditions, meaning that the monarchy would protect them and see to the well-being of society as a whole. So that's what gives the monarchy the right to rule. And of course, what that suggests, although Rousseau didn't push this part, other revolutionary thinkers would, that means you can take and withdraw that approval. Why? Because if the monarchy isn't fulfilling its part of the contract, if it isn't seeing to the best interests of society, then that's it. And of course, if you have to, it might mean not just getting rid of a particular king, it might mean getting rid of the whole monarchy. And we will see in the English Revolution, they'll cut the king's head off. Well, no, they actually, yeah, they did cut his head off. They just didn't use a guillotine. And then in the French Revolution, they had gotten more advanced and they used the guillotine. Uh, but in both cases, they executed the monarch. And this is a far cry from divine right monarchy, right? This is God's divinely appointed you know, ruler. And they executed both of them in part inspired by such ideas that indeed if the monarch has failed to fulfill his obligations to the people, then he'll have to go and maybe the whole monarchy with him. This is the idea of popular sovereignty. And you may still have a king, but the king can only rule if he has popular support. So what is the world that is coming into being, at least in the minds of these thinkers and later through these revolutions that we're going to be looking at? A world of popular sovereignty, where people choose their rulers. A world of rationalism, the belief that rational thought can be used to reshape human society, social institutions, political institutions, even religious institutions and religious ideas. All are subject to rational analysis and improvement. Secularism, which is the idea coming out of the scientific revolution that there are really two spheres of interest to human beings. One is the physical world around us, the world of other human beings, of the natural order, uh, I should say the natural world, the physical world around us, which we can use rational thought in, scientific analysis. We can study it, reshape it, improve it. That's secularism. It doesn't mean that we don't have religious beliefs, but religious beliefs belong out there somewhere. They belong in here, in my own mental processes. They belong in a consideration of my ultimate destiny. But when I want to talk about politics, when I want to talk about how to you know, improve production in my shop, etc., now I'm talking the real world. Now I need to use these scientific principles, these principles of the emerging you know, political analysis and economic analysis. Two different worlds. That's what secularism means. Splitting the here and now from the religious. 
emphasis on individualism, the importance of the individual. And of course, this will come down to individual rights. The Reformation helps emphasize that. We need to emphasize the rights of the individual, whether it's in the religious sphere or in the political sphere. Popular sovereignty and the Reformation have a lot in common, hmm? emphasizing the rights of the individual to exercise authority in religion and in politics. And then capitalism, something that we'll get into in greater detail later, but we see the beginnings of with the ages of commerce, increasing wealth, questions about things like uh, the guild system and whether it is the best thing to do to maintain stable prices and fixed production, or should we go out and produce as much as we can as cheaply as we can, and the whole idea of a wage system. And remember, those peasants who have fixed dues to pay, that doesn't work very well on a capitalist system. What are we going to do about that? These issues, these forces, these influences, will come into play in the first three revolutions we'll be looking at in England and France and North America. The English Civil War, the French Revolution, the American Revolutions. The issues at stake, as we will see, are issues that have, we've just covered in many ways. The Reformation, okay, the Protestant Reformation, particularly important in the English Civil War. Popular sovereignty versus divine right monarchy. You know, who shall rule? And more importantly, why do they have the right to rule? Private property versus monarchical power. Remember we talked about the nobility's idea of liberty and the bourgeois idea, the bourgeoisie's idea about equal rights, equality. They're both concerned about what the monarchy can do, its powers and its rights, and particularly over private property. Individual rights. What rights does the individual have specifically within the political and legal system? Seeing this emphasis on individualism, how will it be expressed in the world as a whole? Capitalism. And finally, nationalism. Although nationalism is less a cause of these revolutions, particularly the French and the American, than a product. So it's an issue, but not so much a cause as a product. So what we're dealing with in this first part of the course, and the revolutions in early modern history, are the end of the traditional order and the rise of modernity. What we've been talking about, without using the word, is modernity. I told you at the beginning of the course, we're going to talk about modernity and westernization. What is modernity? Modernity is the sum total of those topics that we just talked about a minute ago, meaning individualism, secularism, rationalism, these are the kinds of ideas that have driven the modern world. They are coming into being, coming to have an effect after the year 1500. And they run through these three revolutions. So we see the end of the traditional order and the rise of modernity in these societies. Privilege by birth and the power of the monarchy are both going to be issues in the emergence of the modern world. Against them will be thrown the ideas of careers open to talent and popular sovereignty. Other issues, wage labor, the rise of capitalism. We'll get into that in far more detail in the individual revolutions, and particularly as we get into not only early modern, but modern revolutions. What happens when peasant lands are going to be broken up, and peasants are going to be asked to function essentially as wage laborers, instead of as traditional peasants in a feudal arrangement. What about, as Barrington Moore suggests, when their landlords abandon them, go off to the cities, but still demand production from them, still demand essentially that they become wage laborers? How will they react? What will happen when artisans turn to wage labor and break with the guild system? Private property. At the heart of the English Civil War is not only the Protestant Reformation, but the whole issue of private property and the rights of private property. And finally, Again, individual rights. To summarize, what are the key factors to look for, or the causal factors, in looking at revolutions as a whole? We haven't talked about modern revolutions yet. We're still in the early modern phase. But taking all those theories together, class conflict and capitalism, 
the international factor, nationalism. These are some of the major theories that we talked about earlier. We call it Karl Marx, Theta Scotchpole. These are the kinds of interpretations of causes that you should be looking for. To what extent are they driven by class conflict, by the rise of capitalism? To what extent do international factors affect revolution and the rise of nationalism? And aside from the grand theories, what about human agency and ideology? Individual actors and their hopes and dreams. And finally, the role of history. What is the role of the history of an individual society and nation? This is vital. Okay, so human agency and ideology and history. And finally, the key questions. And these are the four that I mentioned at the beginning. These are the questions we'll ask over and over, revolution by revolution. What are the historical factors? What is in the history of this individual country that led to revolution? Secondly, why do revolutions occur? Here you can come in with the theories we just talked about, you know, whether it's Marx or you know, Chalmers, Johnson, etc. Three, who are the major actors and what are their goals? And then what are the effects of revolution? So again, what are the historical factors in each country that bring on revolution? Why do revolutions occur? And here we're talking theory, class conflict, economic factors, international factors. Third, who are the major actors? The elites, the peasants, the workers. And what are their goals? As diverse as they may be. And finally, what are the effects of revolution? Next week, we'll review these four key factors before we start talking about our first revolution, the English Revolution. And in each revolution, we'll look at historical background and try to answer these four key questions. Okay? Next week, we start with the first early modern revolution again. That's the English Civil War. And again, each time, keep these four factors in mind. These are the four questions that we're trying to answer with each revolution. Okay, that's the end of today's lecture. Thanks very much.